Hi, this is Ben with Novalex Stereophonic, and today in front of us we have an example of the Pioneer SX1250 stereo receiver. This receiver is considered by many to be one of the best, if not the best, receiver that Pioneer ever produced, um, and throughout the video we will see why that might be the case. We're going to do some comparisons between this model and its uh, successor, the SX1280. Um, I'm going to take you around a, a tour of the front panel, how all the controls and features work. We'll look at the back, go through all the jacks and connections. Then we'll open up the unit, take a peek at the inside. I'll do a review of the restoration that I've done to the unit and, and give you some things to think about if you are interested in purchasing one of these. And uh, then to conclude, we'll just wrap up on what makes these very collectible and desirable units. So if that sounds cool, stick around and we'll get started. First, I'd like to cover some general information on the SX1250. So this unit was produced between 1976 and 1978, and it retailed for around $950. Output power is rated at 160 watts RMS per channel into 8 ohms. And some of the things that make it better than other, other receivers and other receivers Pioneer made, like the 80 series, was the superior build quality, which we'll see on the inside. And it has some additional shielding on the um, tuner section and phono stage. The SX1280 was Pioneer's answer to this unit, and that one was produced from 78 to 79, also retailing for $950. And its output, they up to 185 watts per channel into 8 ohms. Some cosmetic differences were on the 1280. These indicators that we see here are all the same color. On the 1280, they are different colored filters on your source selection. They did left and right power output meters, which is kind of neat. They also have these little sliding things on the bottom of the 1280 that allow you to kind of mark your favorite stations. And then the final thing they did was a little uh, uh, knob that allows you to change the loading on the moving magnet phono stage. Um, overall, they're you know comparable units, but the consensus is that this is a, a better build quality unit, which we will see when we look at the inside of it. Um, but the 1280 does have some more power and it's actually a really, uh, really, really nice looking unit. So it's kind of your choice on which one you want to go with, but for reasons that I'll outline in a bit, my preference would be the 1250. Okay, let's take a look around the front panel of the unit. So we're going to power on. In a moment, we're going to hear a relay click from the back of the unit. So that click just tells us that everything is safe to operate. It's basically connecting the output of the power section to the speaker terminals. So going on with speakers, we have A, B, and C here. Now, what this allows us to do is select between three different sets of speakers. Examples could be you are running a main system right next to the receiver and then you have a set of speakers in another room. Um, also, a lot of people will hook up multiple sets of speakers and do comparisons between them. So this allows you to run up to two together. If you try to do three together, the unit is going to kill the output and that's the, that's the protect it. So we'll see on the back panel that um, we're not supposed to go be below a certain load on the amplifier. Um, so you can only parallel two speakers together at once. So you can do any combination, A, C, B and C, whatever you like. You just can't do three at once. So we're back on B. First up, we're going to go through the FM section. So I'm gonna select FM here. And here we have a signal and a tuning meter. The signal is just how, how much of a signal or how strong of a signal is coming in. And the tuning shows us, are we centered on, on that station? So I've gone through and done a full FM and AM alignment on this unit. I have no antenna connected, and this thing is pulling stations really well. So let's, uh, let's give it a listen. So we can see, I'm in New York City here, so I've got a lot of stations. So we can see stereo indicator is coming on once the station is, you know, receiving that stereo broadcast. This button here, muting off, basically allows you to hear the, the noise between the channels. The function of this is if you have a, a station that's really weak that you're trying to tune into and it's below the, the muting threshold of the unit, you can, you know, get onto a station that you otherwise wouldn't be able to receive. It might have a little bit of static in the background, but you could still listen to it. So that's, when this is off, you hear it's quiet. When you're in between stations, it keeps it quiet and only unmutes when you're locked in. Another one up here. Let's 
All right, so let's swing through the AM band. I'm just going to go down a little bit here. And on, in AM, only the signal meter works. The tuning meter is not present. That's AM there. And then the other tuner related thing we have here is the multipath switch. And this is just for fine tuning your antenna. So if you're an FM and there's a couple stations that are really close together, you can use this multipath button in conjunction with the movement of your antenna to optimize the reception for the station that you're looking for. All right, so that takes care of the tuner. Um, on the auxiliary, we're just gonna do a quick uh, Quick listen. So this receiver only has one auxiliary input, but uh, it does have two uh, tape inputs. So you could technically plug three line level sources into this unit. You would just have to manage your source selection with these switches rather than this row up here. Okay, so next up is the phono stage. So this unit has a uh, moving magnet phono stage. So it does not work with moving coil cartridges or it doesn't have enough gain to properly amplify a moving coil cartridge by itself. Um, and it has two inputs, meaning you can plug in two turntables and switch between them. You'll also notice that there's a slash mic indication on this one. That means that when, when you're activated on Phono 2, uh, these are also in the, in the signal path, those mic input jacks. So on Phono 1, I've got a turntable running and we're just going to listen to a little bit of music from my buddy Bruce's band, Young Elk. And I'll put a link to their music in the description below if you're interested in learning some more about them. So right now we're listening to Phono and we'll go through all of the, uh, the tone control circuitry. So starting out with the filters up here so that we can be done with this top section, the eight kilohertz is just going to cut the very, very high part of the, of the music it's basically like a, a filter that um, that just cuts out the highs. So if we're hearing cymbals, you'll kind of lose some of the some of the top end of the cymbals. The 30 hertz, this button is mostly for turntable rumble. So if you notice you're walking around your floor or when your system is just idling on the phono input, you can notice the cones of your speakers pulsing in and out. You might have some low frequency vibrations that are working their way into the phono cartridge. So this will help uh, with that. All right, so let's go through balance. So this balance knob here, when I rotate it to the left, I've only got audio on the left channel, only audio in the right channel, and there's a little detent in the middle, a little notch. You'll see this click. So it clicked right there, and now it's locked into the middle. So in most situations, if you have your listening space set up correctly, you're not going to need to mess with the balance, but if you're you know, listening position is slightly off center and the, the center image is kind of shifted over, you can use this to compensate for that. Um, stereo versus mono is pretty much self-explanatory. When you go into the mono mode, if you have a stereo source, it's just going to combine those together and send the information out to both channels equally. Loudness, what this does is it puts a preset EQ curve on the whole output um, of the preamp section, which compensates for uh, th what the human ear interprets as flat at a low listening level. So when the loudness is engaged at lower volumes, it sounds more flat to our ears. So you can hear kind of the bass, uh, bass in the treble get affected in a way that's, that sounds a little bit nicer when we're at low listening levels. The EQ section, we have a few different bands. We have 50 hertz, 100 hertz, 10 kilohertz, and 20 kilo, uh, kilohertz. 20 kilohertz is right at the edge of the human range of hearing. So this is just going to affect the very, very top end. Um, so if you, you're, the cymbals are a little bit too loud for you, you can back this off a little bit from zero, for example. The 10 kilohertz is gonna be much more audible. And then these ones are for uh, fine tuning the bass. When the tone selector here is in the off position, it means that this is all out of circuit. So if you are listening to an album, you want to hear it you know, as flat as possible, you probably have your tone circuit disengaged. But if you have a set of speakers that's too bright or 
you um, are dealing with a, an old tape that is lacking in the base or something, this is, uh, is a way that you could compensate for that. So let's bring in the tone circuit. So again, that's gonna be very difficult to hear. Much easier to hear that 10 kilohertz being affected. 100 hertz, this will be bass. And my speakers, their frequency response does not go down this low, so we'll probably not hear a whole lot on this one. And just to clarify, I do not have a stereo microphone plugged in, so this is all in mono. Um, what we got here left. This adapter is basically a, a loop on the back. So when we engage it, we lose our audio. It's an in, in and out of the back that allows you to put some sort of um, you know reverberation unit or special accessory uh, in a loop. And then when we engage the tape inputs, of course, that mutes the sound from the, the source that's selected. Duplicate switch is just for tape copying purposes. And then the final thing here is the muting. What this does is you can, you can still hear the, the audio, but it's, it's much quieter. This is great if you have a really efficient set of speakers. This is a high power amplifier. So if you're running a set of like Klipsch horns or, or Klipsch heresies or something, a horn loaded speaker that's very efficient, you might not get you know, past this before it's at listening level, um, which gives you very little adjustment range for volume. So by engaging this muting circuit, there's an extra resistance added to the attenuation, which gives you much more granularity. So now to get to that same listening level, I have all of these notches to go through. So that's where that muting is most useful. So that takes care of the front panel demonstration. Next, we'll flip this thing around and we'll take a look at all the connections on the back. Okay, we've now got the unit spun around and we're taking a look at the back panel of the SX1250. So First, we'll start off with the, uh, the, all the input and output jacks out here. So we've got Phono 1, Phono 2, and AUX, which correspond to the, to the buttons and the lights on the front. There's a ground for each of the two turntable inputs down here. For Tape Deck 1, we have a record and a playback. If you're going to plug a CD player in, for example, you would plug it into the play jacks, flip that switch down for Tape 1, and then you'd be able to listen to the, to the CD player. Um, on tape two, it's the same thing, except we have a, uh, a DIN jack here that puts the function of this, there's five pins, so there's one ground, or sorry, there's, yes, one ground and then four um, other pins to allow you the same connections, but in a single cable. This would go between like a Pioneer tape deck and the SX1250, just to clean up your cabling. And then the adapter, uh, this is a, um, a, uh, a loop that can get activated on the front. It may have something to do with quadraphonic reproduction, I'm not sure, as well as this FM detector out. This, my understanding is that this is for troubleshooting purposes and, and scope stuff, but there may be some sort of four-channel application that I'm not aware of. So maybe in the comments someone can chime in on exactly what these were intended for. We have an FM uh, de-emphasis down here. Let me see if I can get the AM out of the way. So this has 25 microseconds and 75 microseconds. Now this is to compensate for the high frequency pre-emphasis that happens on the FM broadcasts. So my guess is that in different parts of the world, there might be a standard for 25 microseconds. So you would remove this little clip, flip the switch, and, and, and put the, you know, the locking clip down on that screw instead. We have our uh, antenna connections down here. So you can hook up an AM antenna, and there's two different ways to hook up a FM antenna here. You've got our AM loop stick antenna. And one of the interesting things about this unit is they chose to, to make the heat sinks in an L shape that wraps around the back. And these are, are really strong. And one of the key things that make this unit easy to service is that you can actually set it on its back. When you have nothing plugged in and the AM antenna is pushed back, you can set this unit on the heat sinks flipped up and it allows you to really easily service the cards on the front of the unit. All right, what's next? Pre-out and power in. So this section is normally seen on, on higher end amplifiers. This is the output of the tuner and preamp section. So all the front panel controls, everything you're manipulating, it comes out of this jack. And then this power amp just goes straight to the output stages. So what this can be used for is if you wanted to just use the tuner and the preamp section of the SX1250 and run it to a, a you know even more powerful amplifier, you could do it through these jacks. 
if you wanted to run a separate preamplifier but use a power amp section of the 1250, you could run a different preamp right into the power amp. Now that's a kind of an uncommon use. The main use for these is for techs like, like me. It makes it very easy to figure out which stage is having an issue. So you're basically splitting the preamp and amplifier section. So if you've got a missing channel, it makes it very easy to figure out is that missing channel because something's wrong in the preamp or something wrong in the power amp. We've got typical 1970s push pin connectors here for each of the three speaker inputs. And then there's a note here that says speaker impedance a, B, or C, basically any of them by themselves, you could do four ohm or higher. Basically it's saying, we don't want the amplifier to see a load below four ohms. When you're combining any combination of the three, they have to be eight ohms or higher because when you parallel them together, you don't want the load to the amplifier to dip below four ohms. Last thing on here is a set of convenience jacks. So we have one that's switched. So when the power uh, switch on the front is turned on, AC 120 volts AC mains power is applied to this jack and then these sockets um, it's just always on. So that is it for the back panel. Next we will open up the unit, take a tour of the inside and see what this thing's all about. With the covers off, we've got a clear look inside of the chassis of this 1250. Um, I just wanted to do a quick overview of kind of where everything's located in this and some things that make it easier to service than some other pieces. So first off, we have guards on the entire front end section, pretty much. So we've got the tuning gang for the, for the AM FM tuner. The actual AM FM tuner circuitry is all underneath this shield. And then the, the phono stage, which is, you know, amplifying very low level signals. So you don't want any interference and stuff to creep in and, and get amplified as well. So it's very important that that's shielded. They did a really good job with that. You won't see that in the, in the 1280. They, they cut that out. Another difference that between the 1250 and the 1280 is the filter capacitors. So these are 22,000 microfarad. In the 1280, they went down to 15,000 microfarad. So there was a bit of a cost cutting uh, happening there. Um, relays. So. There's two relays in this unit. There's one that's all the way in the bottom of the chassis between these two capacitors. That one is the soft start relay to protect the toroidal power transformer. So when we, when we first click on the unit, for a split second, the, there's a circuit that puts a resistor um, before the power transformer, just to, to start it up a little bit uh, more, more carefully. And then after that, after that period is done, it, um, it engages the relay and, sh and shorts out that connection so that you're getting full power to your transformer. So that you really don't hear it click because it happens so fast and happens simultaneously with when you power on the unit. The click that you're really listening for is that couple seconds after power on, this guy right here will click. That's the speaker protection relay. If that doesn't click, it usually means that there's something wrong with one of your two out output stages. It can happen where something is wrong with the, the circuitry itself in the, the uh, protection circuit, but it's more likely that something has gone out of spec on one of these output channels uh, that's keeping it from engaging. So things that make this easier to ser service than others is it's a modular based design. There are four cards in the back of this that are uh, connected with these various connectors. On the cards in the middle here, there's just on the bottom, the output cards for the power amplifier have connections on the top and the bottom, as well as this little um, uh, temperature sensing uh, device on the heatsink. But anyways, the, the construction is really cool. So this is a card from a, another 1250 that I'm working on. Um, this is the protection circuit with the protection relay. So it's an individual PCB, and then there's four of these little metal caddies. So this PCB sits in there like that. Whoops, I have to get it in there. And then two little screws hold it in place, and that is your protection card. So you can imagine it's much easier to pull out an entire panel and get to the back of it and service it, like this one, 
than it is to say flip a unit on its side, pull all the output transistors, flip off a heat sink and you know and, and remove an output card. It's just a lot simpler to get to everything. Another thing that makes it really nice is that the output cards are identical. Uh, this is, you know, I would think any manufacturer would want to do things this way where they don't have two different PCBs, mirror image that they have to construct. They just construct, you know, thousands of these output cards and they can work in either the left or the right channel. This makes it nice for troubleshooting because if you have one channel that's not working properly and you've confirmed your output transistors are fine, you can swap your driver cards as long as you turn down the bias a little bit and you can uh, figure out if, if, you know, everything is good on all the connections and things by flipping those cards and get it isolated very quickly. Another thing that'll happen is if your relay doesn't click, what I always like to do is I pull the output cards, turn it on. If the relay clicks, usually the protection circuit is good and one of your two channels is bad. So then you can put in one at a time and turn it on and see if you can get one channel working at a time to help isolate which component might be causing the failure. So that um, modular design plus the ability to tip this thing on its back, also on its side. The heat, the heat sinks are with the front cover removed. The, they've got enough weight that you can put it up on its side on the heat sink, and it'll stay. It can go up on its back. It's just really, really easy to work on. So where that comes in is, um, if you don't have a fully restored unit, it, your device is going to need service from time to time. It's just the nature of the beast. So having a unit that is easy for a technician to service is a bonus for you. It means that hopefully the repair price might be a little bit cheaper because it doesn't take as long to service and you're gonna have an easier time finding a tech. Some of these obscure pieces, like I've got a, a Kenwood 650 uh, sitting right below this, that thing is a little bit of a pain to service. It's It does have a modular power supply card, but getting to the amp channels requires you to kind of fully open the entire unit. So units like this that you can just pop the covers, pull cards, much more appealing for a technician to work on. Next up, I'm going to review some of the uh, some of the things that happen during a typical restoration of one of these units, and some specific stuff that was uh, done to this one. So, starting off, you'll notice that flanking the toroidal power transformer are these big blue filter capacitors. Now, if you're looking to to purchase one of these, and it's been claimed to be restored. Uh, there's some things that you want to look out for to make sure that you're getting you know, the best bang for your buck or getting what you paid for. So if you're looking at pictures of one of these and the seller has a picture of the inside and you see these blue caps, that means they've definitely been replaced. Now, if you do see that they're black, they're likely still the originals, which are almost always Nichicon or United Chemicon. These are rated at 22,000 microfarads. Um, and what I want to uh, touch on is that if they're still the original can, these original diameter, I think the blue ones are slightly uh, taller, but if you see the original black ones, it's not necessarily a disqualifier. Oftentimes, uh, these will test very close to the original capacitance value and, and low leakage. So these are okay to stay in a lot of times. So if the seller has claimed that they checked them and they're good, if they're a reputable uh, seller and you're confident they have decent test equipment, then that's probably okay to leave those in place. So what I'm trying to say is it's not a disqualifier if the original filter caps are still in place. Next up, I just want to give some perspective on, uh, you know, when one of these is rebuilt, why all the caps might be replaced. Um, and the, the, the reason is while you're, while you're in there with all these cards and stuff removed, it's nice to, to upgrade everything so that it doesn't potentially fail later. But just a little bit of perspective here. These are all the parts I removed that are good. These, these could have stayed in the unit technically, uh, but over these are you know 40 plus years old and over time eventually some of these are going to fail. So if we're in there, we might as well get them replaced. So that's capacitors. There's also some trimmer pots in here. So a lot of times these, let's see if I can find one in here. Yeah, right here. A lot of times these little trimmer pots are okay as well. Um, but while, while we're in there, upgrading to a nice Borns unit that, that doesn't have any scratchiness and stuff is going to be ideal for a bias adjustment. Also, um, some of the recommended changes to this during a restoration is to put multi-turn pots in certain sections to make it uh, so that you can get a really accurate uh, alignment. These are all the capacitors and, and transistors that were removed either because they are known troublemakers or they have already become out of spec. So a capacitor like this, for example, um, this one probably tested fine for uh, 
uh, for ESR, but the, the microfarad value had probably creeped up way above the 20% uh, tolerance. These little orange guys um, tend to go uh, high ESR fairly quick, and these are right in the signal path. So at 2.2 microfarad, these all get replaced with film caps, uh, which test near perfect. So, And then these tantalums, these little blue guys, are really good caps, but they can, when they fail, they, they, they fail badly. They don't have a good failure mode. So these often get replaced depending on which circuit they're in. For transistors, we'll go over more in a second. Let me see if I can find one with the black leg corrosion. Here's a good example. So, oops, I got another tantalum stuck here with that. So a lot of times these transistors will end up getting this black uh, material on the legs which can eventually creep up into the case of the transistor and cause it to become intermittent or noisy. So there's certain ones that are known to go bad uh, more than others so those ones get pulled and replaced with modern uh, semiconductors that have equivalent properties. So again even though all these parts were good, they came out and got replaced because we already had the cards removed, the labor was getting done anyways. It's better to just get the old ones out and, and put, in, put in a new set. The other thing is if you, uh, if you just keep replacing the components as they fail, the, the unit is going to keep having to go back to service over the years as things get out of spec. Um, okay, so next thing I wanted to touch on is thermal stress. So this is a... Uh, this is a stabilizer card or, or power supply card from another SX1250 that I'm working on. And what you'll notice on here is a, many of the capacitors, you can see that kind of that silver top. What's happening here is these components are thermally stressed and the outside portion is getting hot and shrinking down. So um, let me have another one here that's a pretty good example or maybe easier to see what's going on here. So all of these capacitors are, you know, have undergone some sort of thermal stress. So even though they might measure good, I'm going to want to replace all these. And then the same thing goes for the semiconductors on these boards. Uh, on, on this unit here, these were all the semiconductors that were on that stabilizer board that tested fine. It was almost all of them, but they, had, they have had a rough life. So while we're in there, this is like the, you know, the number one thing prone to fail in one of these these units is these stabilizer cards. Uh, so this gets a full recap, all new transistors, um, and then all the resistors are checked to, to be within tolerance and not open, all the diodes are checked. Uh, so yeah, it's basically proactive service on this one because this, this, the card actually worked. Uh, the pr protection worked, the uh, stabilizer card worked, and one channel worked, but one driver card was really messed up. Uh, and it looked like the stabilizer had actually been worked on. So let me show you another thing that can happen from time to time. So on the card that looked like this that was in the 1250 in front of us, it had previously been worked on. And there's a lot of like, it looks like someone was just grabbing miscellaneous caps out of their drawer. I've never heard of this brand. There's another winner. Like all these, the only like real part that I found that was in there was an Elna. And this might have been a pull from another unit, you never know. So well, that's another reason I like to, to replace everything on the, on the stabilizer card is because they're prone to failure, it's possible they've been worked on in the past. And these were obviously some subpar caps and also uh, some of them were the incorrect value and the incorrect position. So I wanted to get those out of there. Some other things we ran into on this one were some, some control issues. So this I believe was the base, uh, the base pot and you can see the shaft uh, is compromised. This was the balance pod. The shaft was sheared straight off on this one. So even though this still spun and worked, uh, I had an SX1250 parts unit on hand, so I just opted to, uh, um, to, swap, to swap these controls out because I had exact replacements. The, the, the shaft on this one's a little bit easier to repair. Um, the broken off shaft requires a little bit more creativity. So we did replace a couple controls in this unit. And then one of the most important things that gets done in a restoration is relay replacement. So this is the old speaker protection relay. And what can happen is the little contacts in here can get 
uh, corroded. They turn black and uh, they can start sparking and stuff like that, uh, which just causes a further pitting and degradation of these contacts. The signal runs directly through these relay contacts. So this is something that is right in the signal path um, and you want it to be as good as possible. So you can pull these covers off. You can unclick these covers and pull them open. And there's uh, some products and tools that you can use to, to burnish or clean these contacts. But it's always, there, there's a special coating on there and there's always a worry of how long is that, that fix going to last? Maybe a year, maybe a couple years, and then this will start becoming intermittent and that's something that we don't want. So uh, these, are, these are fairly expensive compared to other single components, but I think it's worth it because it's right in the signal path. So uh, I replaced both relays in this unit, the, the soft start relay and the protection relay. Uh, what else? So this this one got an LED upgrade as well. Um, let me show you this. So lamps are really easy in this one. So these housings just have a couple metal contacts that spin into that green plate over there. And there's some uh, some sellers that have these uh, LED wedge lamps, which are great. This is a, a warm white kit, uh, which looks a little bit on the white side, but. Um, the advantage of the LED is the the meters and the the tuning dial and everything everything looks really great in daylight. Uh, with the original incandescence, it's a little bit uh, you know more subdued during the day. It's really nice at night, but the LED, LED is great for both. Um, now we also did LED for all the indicators, which are located in these little sockets uh, underneath this plate here. Now that is something that is pretty difficult for a beginner to change. I could see somebody that that you know is just a little bit curious. They can open up the case. But they don't really want to do any soldering. You could probably replace these, uh, but you're going to get an inconsistency because the the incandescent on the indicators are going to be so dim. So, I guess it's a word of warning. The changing out the the LEDs on the indicators for source and uh, speaker, you know, ABC speaker uh, lights. Those are a little bit tough. Um, on this one, the best way to do it is to flip the units on its, on its back, remove some of the cards, get to the point where you can actually see the connections of the lamps, desolder the old ones or untwist them from the posts and put in the new ones and run them through to their positions. So that, that's a little bit more involved to, to do a full LED upgrade on this guy. Before we wrap up, I wanted to do a, a cosmetic overview of this specific piece because in your searches, you may come across some of these and want to know you know, how big of a deal is it if there's damage in certain areas. So on this one, we can see there's some, some marring along the top edge here, a little mark on the front of the face plate. Uh, there's kind of a scratch here that continues into the wood a little bit. Uh, so stuff like that that's to the face plate itself is very hard to address. The, the, the scratching that happens on the top is very common, this metal piece, because people would stack things on top of these and kind of pull them back and forth. So oftentimes you'll see scratches along this top edge. Those are not super visible when you have this at like a normal, if you have it in an equipment rack or at like a normal height, you're not really gonna notice that. The ones on the front here, there's not a whole lot that you can, you can do. So when you're shopping for one of these, if you're really looking for a collector grade piece, something that is is going to be the top of the top you know for maintaining its value you're going to want to look for one with a clean face plate now knobs are a little bit different these knobs are fairly common they were used on a lot of different models it seems like there's two different eras some of them have uh, a little bit more metal content to them they're thicker with a smaller plastic insert but they all have the same cosmetic look so the knobs are fairly easy to come by uh, with the exception of the volume and the the tuning uh, so if you have a really marred up and messed up tuning dial, maybe if you're looking to buy one of these, check on eBay first and see if there's some availability uh, so that you don't get stuck with a unit with a really messed up looking control for a few months. Uh, so not knobs and switch caps, this stuff is easy. These, if one of these is scratched up, there's you just have to pull the plate, there's a spring mechanism, you can replace these. So as long as it's, uh, you know, the actual controls themselves, those are, those are fairly easy to get. Now for the wood, these can be re-veneered. On this one, I opted to leave the original veneer on it because it has such a beautiful grain that if I go out and buy a piece of uh, veneer, it'll probably look nice, but it won't have the, the extra dimension. When the sun shines on this correctly, it almost has like a flame maple type texture to it and it looks so nice I wanted to keep it. Uh, these back 
plates, if these get really rusty and corroded, you can repaint them. This is the original stock brown. It does have some blemishes, but with this little marring here and some light scratching in the wood, it all kind of you know goes together with the this piece. It's a little bit of character. If I was to go and refinish the this plate and then the wood was a little bit scratched up, it might look a little bit odd. So I, I opted to leave everything kind of you know, original with it, with the wear that it's achieved over the years, with the exception of the heat sinks. The heat sinks can end up looking really terrible if they start to, to chip because you'll get exposed aluminum and stuff. So when I had the heat sinks off for cleaning, I sandblasted them and repainted them with a semi-gloss black and they turned out really, really nice. Um, so that's a, that's about it for the cosmetics, I guess. Um, just on the on the wood, this can always be refinished if you have the skill. Uh, it's you know a matter of pulling the old veneer and putting a new veneer on it. Uh, and these th these pieces here on the side are solid. This is uh, solid wood, so they can be unscrewed from the inside. And if you wanted to, you could uh, you could sand off any scratches. You can refinish them with oil or your favorite finish. Or this is something that's easy enough for if you're a woodworker, you can remake this part very very easily. So uh, I guess. The, the things to consider are make sure you look at the faceplate in detail and are comfortable with any uh, any things, you know, blemishes on the faceplate because that you probably can't do anything about. If you have knobs and switches that are a little bit marred up, not the end of the world. You can wait for a good price on a replacement part on, on eBay and, and get those and, you know, make it prettier, you know, throughout the your ownership of the unit. Uh, one other thing to, to watch out for that you'll see a lot of times on these is on the back, check the, uh, the antenna. A lot of times the AM loop stick antenna will get smashed or cracked or something like that. So make sure to take a close look at that. Those can be, you know, sourced, that antenna piece, but it involves having to track down the solder points inside of the unit, maybe splicing some cables in. So that's, that's again, like those, these indicator LEDs, not the easiest to replace for a beginner, but it is possible. All right, so the final part of this is going to be talking about why these units are so desirable. And it comes down to a few things. I mean, just looking at it, this is a beautiful piece of, of audio history here. They look amazing. Uh, they have 160 watts per channel, the crazy output power that will drive most vintage speakers just fine. So you've got the power, you've got the looks. The build quality is superior to a lot of other brands from the era and as well as other lines of Pioneer. So above this we have the SX1280 um, and the SX1980. Now those each have higher wattage but the handoff is a little bit lower build, build quality. The 1980 especially is susceptible to power supply failure. Uh, if you're looking at a 1980 make sure that the power supply has been rebuilt otherwise you're going to have to do it soon. Uh, so these kind of check all the boxes for reliability, um, build quality, and then all the things I mentioned about serviceability, the ability to tip this thing on its back, on its side, uh, pull the driver cards, the protection card, the power supply card, and work on them outside of the chassis. Uh, the extra shielding and stuff that's on, side of the, or on the top of the, the tuner and the, the phono stage circuitry. So overall, great, great unit. And at the moment, the price of these is on an upward trajectory. We don't know how long that's going to last. The vintage market uh, seems to be on a steady incline. I would think that this would be a great investment piece because it is one of the best of the best pioneers. Um, but who knows what's gonna happen in the market. Uh, but at the moment, these have an, an, an upward slant and, and I don't see it ending, ending uh, soon with the rate that things are going. So um, that wraps up the video. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick swing down here to give you a little tease of what's coming next. We've got a Marantz uh, 1120 that I just finished last night and this beautiful Kenwood Supreme 650. This is the Euro model with the gunmetal gray faceplate. Really, really cool unit. So if you liked what, uh, what you saw uh, today on the SX1250 and you want to see more stuff from me, please subscribe, like this video, and uh, thank you for watching. Come back for more. We'll see you next time.